uh, and we're particularly interested in regard to the origin of psychological disorder and what is necessary to heal that disorder. Perhaps we could start with the question of what is the source of psychological disorder? Yes, sir. And I would like to ask, if I may, what do we mean by disorder? When the whole world, as one knows, as one sees it from continent to continent, uh -huh. there is a great deal of disorder. Yes. Economically, socially. This is one of a series of dialogues between J. Krishnamurti, David Bohm, Rupert Sheldrake, and John Hidley. The purpose of these discussions is to explore essential questions about the mind. What is psychological disorder, and what is required for fundamental psychological change? J. Krishnamurti is a religious philosopher, author, and educator who has written and given lectures on these subjects for many years. He has founded elementary and secondary schools in the United States, England, and India. David Bohm is professor of theoretical physics at Birkbeck College, London University in England. He has written numerous books concerning theoretical physics and the nature of consciousness. Professor Bohm and Mr. Krishnamurti have held previous dialogues on many subjects. Rupert Sheldrake is a biologist whose recently published book proposes that learning in some members of a species affects the species as a whole. Dr. Sheldrake is presently consulting plant physiologist to the International Crops Research Institute in Hyderabad, India. John Hidley is a psychiatrist in private practice who has been associated with the Krishnamurti School in Ojai, California for the past six years. In the culture, there are conflicting points of view about the proper approach to dealing with one's own or others' psychological problems. And the underlying principles from which these approaches are drawn are in even greater conflict. Without invoking a narrow or specialized point of view, can the mind, the nature of consciousness, its relationship to human suffering, and the potential for change be understood? These are the issues to be explored in these dialogues. Is disorder the very nature of the self? Why, why do you say that? Why do you ask that? If, is it the nature of the self? Isn't the self, the me, the ego, yeah. whatever word we like to use, isn't that divisive? Isn't that exclusive, isolating process, the self-centered activity which causes so much disorder in the world? Isn't that the origin, the beginning of all disorder? The origin being uh, selfish activity. Yeah, self-centered activity at all levels of life. Yes, and certainly that's the way in which the patient comes in. He's concerned about his depression. Yes. Or his fear. His fulfillment, his joy, his suffering, his yes. agony, and so on. It's all self-centered. Yes. So I'm asking, if I may, is not the self the beginning of all disorder? The self, I mean, the egotistic attitude towards life, the sense of individual emphasis on the individual, his salvation, his fulfillment, his happiness, his anxiety, and so on, so on. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's the source of the thing. It's certainly the way he experiences it and presents it. He presents it as his. Yes, but it, I mean, if you go all over the world, it is the same expression, it is the same way of living. Uh -huh. They're all living their own personal lives, mm -hmm. unrelated to another. Though they may be married, they may do all kinds of things, but they're really functioning from an isolated uh, center. And that that uh, center, that self, yeah. is the source of the difficulty in the relationship, in the relationship and the difficulty that creates the symptoms. Yeah. And I wonder if, if the psychologists have tackled that problem. 
that the self is the origin, the beginning of all contradiction, divisive activity, self-centered activity, and so on? Uh, no. I think that the way it, the psychiatrists and psychologists look at this is that the problem is to have an adequate self. Adequate self? Yeah. Which means what? Defining normality. A self that is functioning sufficiently. Suffic efficiently. Yeah. Which means furthering more misery. Uh, well, I don't feel that the psychiatrists would necessarily agree with you that, on that last point. That they might feel that a proper or properly organized self could get together with other properly organized selves and make an orderly society. Yes. And you're saying, as I understand it, something quite different. Yes. <laughs> Which is, but no self can do it. No, no structure of the self can make order. That's right. right. The very nature of the self must intrinsically bring disorder. Yes, but can, I'm not sure this will be clear to, uh, you know, uh, how, do we, how can that be made clear, you know, evident? Well, it, sorry, it seems to me that this is the, the context is even broader than that of psychology. Because in the world we have all sorts of things which are not human beings with selves. There are animals and um, plants and all the forces of nature and all the stars and so on. Now we see disorder in nature too. It may not be consciously experienced. And a cat that's suffering, or a lion that's suffering, or a mouse, or even an earthworm that's suffering may not come into a psychiatrist's office and say so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the fact is that there seems to be disorder and conflict within nature. There are conflicts between forces of nature, inanimate things, earthquakes, and so on. There are conflicts within the animal world. There are even conflicts within the plant world. Plants compete for light, and the bigger ones get higher up in the forest, and the smaller ones get shaded out and die. There's conflict between predators and prey. All animals live on other plants or animals. Um, there's uh, every kind of conflict. There's disease, there's suffering, there's parasites. All these things occur in the natural world. So is the context of psychological suffering and disorder something that's merely something to do with the mind, or is it something to do with the whole of nature, and the fact that the world is full of separate things, and that if we have a world which is full of separate things, and these separate things are all interacting with each other, that um, there's always going to be conflict in such a world. Well, so I'm wondering, uh, uh, is it clear that nat there is that kind of disorder in nature, or would we say that disorder is only in human consciousness? Yes. Uh, that is what this, the phenomena that you have described. Are they actually disorder? That's a question we have to go into. Or what is the difference between the disorder in consciousness and whatever is going on in nature? I saw the other night on the television, a cheetah chasing a deer, mm. killing it. Would you consider that disorder? Well, I would consider that it involves suffering. Suffering, yes. So, are we saying that it is natural for in nature and in human beings to suffer, to go through agonies, to, to live in disorder? Yes. Um, so, what do you say to that, sir? Well, I think that's the way it's uh, looked at by the therapist. To some degree, it's felt that this arises um, in the course of development, and that some people have it more than others, suffering. Some people are more fortunate in their upbringing, for example, or in their heredity. But it isn't questioned that that may not be necessary uh, in any absolute sense. Hmm. Well, that's what we're questioning. That's what I would like to question, too. Yeah. Dr. Sheldrake says, it is accepted. It's like that. Mm -hmm. Human condition is to suffer, to struggle, to have anxiety, pain, disorder. That's, that's well, it's his certainly, condition. It's certainly necessary to have physical suffering. People get sick, they die. And we're wondering whether or not psychological suffering is analogous to that, or whether there's something intrinsically different about it. No, sir. I do question seriously whether human beings 
must inevitably live in this state. Mm-hmm. Everlastingly suffering, everlastingly going through this agony of life. Is that necessary? Is it right that they should? It's certainly not desirable that they should. No, no. If we accept that it's inevitable, mm-hmm. as many people do, then there is no answer to it. Mm-hmm. But is it inevitable? Well, physical suffering is inevitable. Yes, illness, I mean, death. Yes, sir, the physical suffering huh. is old age, yes. accidents, disease. Maybe we increase the physical suffering because of our psychological problems. That's it. That's it. Sir, mm. mother bearing babies, mm. she goes through terrible time mm. delivering them. She, strangely, she forgets that pain. She's the next baby. Another baby. Mm. In India, as you know, the mothers have about seven or eight children. Mm. If they remember the first agony of it, they will never have children. Mm. I've talked to several mothers about it. They seem to totally forget it. Mm. It's a blank after suffering. So, is it, is there an activity in this psyche that helps the suffering to be wiped away. Recently, personally, I've had an operation for minor operation. There was plenty of pain, quite a lot. And it went on considerably. It's out of my mind, completely gone. Mm. So is it the psychological nourishing of a remembrance of pain, you follow? Mm. Mm -hmm. Which gives us a sense of continuity in pain. So you're saying that perhaps the the physical suffering in the world is not the source of the psychological suffering, but that the psychological suffering is is an action of its own. Yes, that. You've had toothache, I'm sure. Yes, I've You've forgotten it. Hmm. Why? If we accept pain is inevitable, hmm. suffering is inevitable, you must continue with it. You must sustain it. No, we ha- have to accept that it's inevitable that it happens sometimes. But we we can forget physical pain. Can we forget the kind of psychological pains caused by natural things like loss, death of people? Yeah, I will come to that. I come to you. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with my wife. I'm married. If I'm not, but suppose I'm married. Mm-hmm. I come. I say to. I come because I can't get on with her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she can't get on with me. Mm-hmm. And we have a problem in relationship. I come to you. How will you help me? This is a problem of everybody is facing. Yes. Either divorce mm-hmm. yeah. or adjustment. Or and I- is that possible when each in the, each one wants to fulfill, wants to go his own way, pursue his own desires, his own ambitions, and so on. You're saying that the problem arises out of the fact that they each have their own interests at heart? No, I, it's not interest. It's like, so we are all terribly individualistic. Yes. Hmm? yes. I want my way, and my wife wants how we? Deeply. And we see that our needs are in conflict for some yes, reason. that's all. Right away you begin. Mm-hmm. After the first few days or few months of... 
relationship pleasure and all that, that soon waves off and we are stuck. Okay, that's the same problem then with the mother raising this child and making it her toy. Her needs are in conflict with the needs of the child. And uh, please, perhaps you go on. The mother, her mother was also like that. Yeah. And the, sir, the whole world is like that, sir. Mm -hmm. It's not the mother. Mm -hmm. So when I come to you with my problem, you say it's the mother. No, I wouldn't I say it's... I object to that. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's the mother. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> pushing it. Uh-huh. You're saying that it's a much broader problem than... Much deeper problem. Okay. Then the mother or the, the mother didn't put the baby on the right pot or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That it appears that the needs are in conflict. No, I wouldn't call needs are in conflict. Basically, they're divisive self-centered activity mm -hmm. that inevitably must bring contradiction and, you know, the whole mm -hmm. business of relationship and conflict. Mm -hmm. Because each one wants his pleasure. There's self-centered activity on the part of the person who's raising the child or on the part of the person who is in the relationship married. Uh, the child is the victim of that. The child? The child is the victim of that. Of course. And then grows up to, perpe to perpetuate it. And the mother's father and mother's father, they were like that too. Yes. Now, why does it have to happen that way? Are we saying that's the way it is in nature, or are we saying that... Oh, no. Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, there are certain conflicts in nature. Um, for example, in, among um, troops of gorillas or baboons, take baboons, or even chimpanzees, mm -hmm. um, there's a conflict among the males. The, the, often the strongest male yeah, wishes to monopolize all the, all the attractive, attractive females. Now some of the younger males want to get in on the act as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they yeah. try going off with these females and this younger male will fight them and beat them off. So they'll be kept out of this. The selfish activity of this one male keeps most of the females to himself. The same occurs in red deer where the stag will monopolize the females. Now, these are examples of conflict in the animal kingdom which are quite needless. There'd be enough food for these hens without pecking each other. Now, these are not exceptions. We can find this kind of thing throughout the animal kingdom. So, I don't think that the origin of this kind of selfish conflict is uh, something just to do with human societies and the way they're structured. I think there's, we can see in biological nature this kind of thing. Are you saying <coughs> that as we are the result of the animal, as we human beings evolved from the animal. Mm. We have inherited all those picking order. Yes, I think we've inherited a lot of animal tendencies yeah, from our obviously, animals for mm. and, and I think that many of these show up in these psychological yes, problems. Yes, but <coughs> is it necessary that we should continue that way? Ah. We, are, we are thoughtful, we are ingenious in our inventions, mm. extraordinarily capable in certain directions. Why should we not also say this, we won't have this. The way we live, let's change it. Well, we can say that. Many people have said it. I know many people have said it. But without very much effect. Why? Well, that indeed is a question. Is it that we're so completely trapped in our oh, so the ancestry of the past? Or so heavily conditioned that it's impossible to be free? Well, there are two the possible kinds of conditioning. One is the genuine biological conditioning that comes from our animal heritage, which means that we inherit all these tendencies. Uh, let's accept that. 
Um, now that is undoubtedly extremely strong and goes right back into our animal past. Right. The other kind of conditioning is the kind of argument that I'm putting forward, perhaps. The argument, this has always been so. So? Human nature is like this. There have always been wars and conflict and all that kind of thing. And therefore there always will be. And that the most we can do is try to minimize these. And there will always be psychological conflicts within families and between people. And that the most we can do is try and minimize yes. these or so at least make the them livable. Accept the modified, mm. but you cannot fundamentally change it. Yes, I'm saying this is a possible kind of conditioning. The belief that we can't really change it radically is another kind of conditioning. I'm a victim of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if it's possible to get out of it. And that's what I want to discuss. Mm -hmm. Whether it's possible to change the human condition mm -hmm. and not accept it. See, as most philosophers the existentialists and others say, your human nature is conditioned. You cannot change, you can modify it. You can be less selfish, less painful, psychologically have problems, uh, bear up with pain, it's natural, it's there. We have inherited from the animals. We'll go on like this for the rest of our, of our lives and for the lives to come. Not reincarnation, lives of other people's hmm. lives. It will mm -hmm. be our condition, human mm -hmm. condition. Do we accept that? Or <coughs> do we inquire, shall we inquire into whether it's possible to change this condition? Yes, I think we should inquire into if that. If you say it cannot be changed, then the argument is over. All right, so I'll say, I'll say, I don't, I don't, no, not say. <laughs> no, I'd like it to be changed. I deeply want it to be changed. Um, so I think that this question of inquiring into the possibility is extremely important. But one of my points, to go back to the conditioning point, is that a lot of this conditioning is deep in our biological nature. And people who wish to change it merely by changing the structures of society... Oh, I'm not talking about the <clears throat> ...are operating at too superficial a level. Like the communists who want to change it. But the idea that you can do it by just changing the environment is what the communists thought and still think. And in a sense, the experiment has been tried, and mm -hmm. we can see the results oh, in various sure. communist countries. And, of course, believers in that would say, well, they haven't tried properly or they betrayed the revolution and so on. But nevertheless, the, the basis of that belief is that the source of all the evils and the problems is in society, and by changing society, mm -hmm. man is perfectible. But society is formed by us. Yes. And you, by us is going to be changed. Mm. So we haven't changed ourselves. We depend on society to change us. Yes. <coughs> and society is what we have made. So we are caught in that trap. Yes. Exactly. And if we start off with a heritage which is built into us, inherited, which comes from our biological past, and if we start with that, and we start with these societies that also have bad effects, some of them, and to varying degrees, and we just try to change the society, the other part, the inherited part, is still there. And we oh, but can, can <coughs> cannot those also be transformed? I, read I, may, I may have inherited what violence from the hmm? mm. from the apes and so on and so on. Mm. Can't I change that? The inherited biological uh, Drive, conditioning. Yes. Mm. Surely that can be transformed. Well, all societies, surely, seek to transform these biological drives that we have, and all processes of bringing children up in all societies seek to uh, bring those drives within the control of the society. Yes, Otherwise, you'd have complete anarchy. However, these drives are always brought within certain social forms, and individual aggression is uh, obviously discouraged in most societies. But can we say, is it really transformed? Doesn't it just come out again in the aggression of the society as a whole, and war and so on? Um, 
So we can see that these things are transformed by societies, these basic drives that we inherit. Um, but why do we... I was going to ask you, you say they really haven't been transformed, but uh, I think the main, your meaning by transformed a fundamental change, and not just a superficial change or a transfer of the object of aggression mm. uh, from other individuals to, others, uh, to other groups. Right? Mm. So if you talk of transformation, you would say really that they would more or less uh, go away, right? That's what I understand. Well, they'd be changed from one form to another. That's no, but I mean, not, I don't think that's the meaning which Krishna G is using for the word transform, but essentially can't we be free of them, you see? That? Yes, that's right. So, why do you divide, if I may ask, hmm. society and being? As though society was something outside, which is influencing me, Mm. conditioning me, but I have my parents, grandparents, mm. so on, past generations, have created that society, mm. so I'm part of that society. I am society. Why oh, do yes. we separate it? I think the reason why we separate it is that there are different kinds of society. If I'd been born in India instead of in England, I would have grown up in a very different way, with of course, a different set of, of attitudes. Of and because we can think of ourselves um, being growing up in different kinds of societies, and we'd be different if we had, that's why in thought, I think, we have the idea that society and me are, are not exactly the same. We'd always be in one society or another. So society as a whole, all societies taken together, would always, we, we would only exist within society. But any particular society is, in a sense, an accident of our birth or upbringing. But even that... Uh, society is part of us. Oh yes, I mean through growing up in it, it yes. becomes part of us and we become but part of it. I, I, I want to abolish this idea in discussion, this separation from me and society. I am society, I am the world. I mean, the result of all these influences, conditioning, whether in the East or in the West or in South or North, it's all part of conditioning. Yes. So uh, we are attacking the condition, not where you are born or east or west. Oh yes, the problem would be conditioning of every kind, our biological conditioning, our conditioning yeah, from that's society. Right. That's right. Yes. So I, personally I don't separate myself from society, I am society. Mm. I have created society through my anxiety, through my desire for security, through my desire to have power and so on and so on. Mm. Mm. like the animal, mm. is all biologically inherited, mm. and also uh, my own uh, individualistic activity has created this society. Mm. So I'm asking, I'm conditioned that way, mm. is it not possible to be free of it? Free of my conditioning? If you say it's not possible, then it's finished. Well, I would say first that it's not possible to be free of all of the conditioning. I mean, certain of it is necessary biologically, the conditioning that makes my heart beat, my oh, lungs no, operate, and all that. Why do I admit all that? Now, then the, the question is, no. how far can you take that, the necessary conditioning? Doctor, Hilly was saying, that's his whole point, I am conditioned to suffer, hmm. psychologically, right, sir? Yes. Or I am conditioned to go through great conflict in my relationship with my wife or father, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you are saying, either we investigate into that and free ourselves from that, or accept it and modify it. That's right. And now, which is it, that's what I want, which is it as a psychologist you maintain? If I may put such a question to you. Yeah. Well, I think generally the approach is to attempt to modify it, to make the person, the pa to help the patient make it work more effectively. Why? I hope you don't mind my asking this question. No, I think that part of the reason for that is that it's seen as biological, and, and therefore fixed. A person is born with a certain temperament. 
Uh, his drives are the drives of the animal. And I think also because uh, it isn't clear in to therapists that the problem can be dealt with as a whole. The problem seems, it, it is clear that it can be dealt with as particulars. Is it, I'm not asking an impudent question, I hope. Okay. Is it the psychologists don't think holistically? are only concerned with solving individual problems. Yes, they are concerned with solving individual problems. So they, therefore they are not thinking human suffering as a whole. Right. A particular suffering of X who is very depressed. Right. For particular reasons. For particular reasons. Right. We don't inquire into what is depression, why human beings all over the world are depressed. Or we don't try and tackle that uh, as a single problem. We try and tackle it with this particular individual who comes in. Therefore you are still really, if I may point out, I may be wrong. Yes. You are emphasizing his particular suffering and so sustaining it. <clears throat> now, can we get clear on that? I come to you. Yes. I'm depressed. Yes. For various reasons which you know. Yes. And you tell me, by talking to me, uh -huh. etc., you have the whole business of coming to you and all that. You tell me, my depression is the depression of the world. Yeah, I don't tell you that. I tell you that your depression... Yeah, that's what... I, when you tell me that, are you not helping me to carry on with this individualistic depression and therefore my depression, not your depression... Yes. ...is my depression, which I either cherish mm -hmm. or want to dissolve. Yes. Which means I'm only concerned with myself. Yes, Myself, I come back to that. Yes, it's within the context of yourself. Self. Yeah. So you are helping me to be more selfish, if I may. Yes. More self-concerned, more self-committed. It is approached within the context of the self. <clears throat> but... I would think that I'm helping you to be less self-concerned because when you're not depressed then you don't have to be self-concerned. You feel better and you're able to relate to people more. But again, on a very superficial level. Meaning that I leave the self intact. Intact. Yes. Yes, well, I feel that people generally uh, wouldn't accept this, that the self is not there, you see, which is what you're implying, that the self is rather unimportant, but uh, rather, the, the assumption is that the self is really there and it has to be improved, you see. And if you say that's it, that's that, that self, a certain amount of self-centeredness, people would say, is normal. Yes, sir. It's only yeah. keep it in, within reason, right? Right. Mm. Uh, now Modi saying, well, modify selfishness, right? Continue with selfishness. Yes. But still go slow. But I think uh, you're yeah. saying something which right. is very <laughs> radical then because uh, it's, uh, very few people have entertained the notion of, of no self-centeredness. That's it. That's right. It isn't entertained. Hmm. Maybe a few, but... Yeah. For biological reasons and because of the universality of the phenomenon well, and because it isn't even seen as relevant, really. I think most people feel that's the only way things are, and that's the only way. Yeah. That means status quo, modified status quo. Yeah. Yes. I, I, to me, that seems so irrational. But uh, you must feel that it's possible to be different. You say at least more than feel, but in some sense there must be some 
reason why you say this. I see. I see what? what why, what? why you feel so different from other people about it? It seems so practical. Hmm? First of all, the way we live is so impractical. The wars, the accumulation but, but of armaments that, is totally impractical. But that wouldn't be an argument. You see, because people say I, we all understand that, but that's uh, but since that's the way we are, there's not nothing else is possible. You see, you really are ask, challenging the notion that that is the way we are. Or you, have to be. You are, I don't quite follow this. We are what we are. If people say we are individuals separate and, uh, and, that, and there's nothing, we'll just have to fight and make the best of it. Yes. But you are saying that something different. I mean, yes. you're not accepting that. All right. Don't accept it, but will you listen? Will the people who don't accept it, will they give their minds to find out? Right? Right. Or say, please, we don't want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. This is what we think, buzz off. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. That's what most people do. Well, this question isn't even raised, usually. Yeah, of course. Now, why do you think that, that the, self, the selfish activity isn't uh, necessary? I don't know, so first of all, do we accept the condition that we are in? Do we accept it? And say, please, we can only modify it, it can never be changed. It can never be, one can never be free from this anxiety, depression, modified always from agony of life. You follow? Mm -hmm. This process of going through tortures in oneself. Mm -hmm. That's normal. Accept it. Modify it. Live a little more quietly and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. If you accept that, the argument, we can't, there's no communication between us. Mm -hmm. But if you say, I know your, my condition, I may perhaps, I may, tell me, let's just talk about whether one can be free from it. Then we have a relationship, then we, have a, we can communicate with each other. But we say, sorry, shut the door on my face, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. finished. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> there are some people who accept this, they say we can't change it. But there are other people, and I would say that some of the most inspiring leaders of the different religions of the world are among them who have said we can change it, yes. there is a way beyond this. Yes. Now, since religions have wide followings, and since uh, their doctrines are widely dispersed, there are in fact large numbers of people in our society, and in every society, who do think it can be changed. Because all religions hold out the prospect of a Possibly. change, and of going beyond this condition. Yes. Uh, but I would like to know, when you use the word religion, hmm. Is it the organized religion? Is it the authoritarian religion? Is it the religion of belief, dogma, rituals, all that? Well, or religion in the sense, the, the, the accumulation of energy to find whether it's possible to be free. You want to say my question? Yes. Well, I think the second, but I think that the, if we look into the history of the organized religions and people within them, we see that much of the inspiration for them was in fact that second kind of religion, which still within their framework still survives, I think. But it's also something which has often been corrupted and debased and turned into yet another system oh, yeah. of dogmas, yeah. conditioning and yeah. so on. But I think with all, within all religious traditions um, that this second kind of religion you talk about has been kept alive. And I think that the impetus in all the great religions of the world has been that vision. It's then been debased and degraded in various ways. But, but this vision has never left any of these religions. There are still people within them, I think, who still have it. And this is the inner life that keeps them going over and above the simple political power. I know, of it. I know. But Suppose a man like me 
rejects tradition, rejects anything that has been said about truth, about God, whatever it is, the other side. I don't know. The other people say, yes, we have this and that. So how am I, as a human being, who has really rejected all this? Mm. Tradition, the people who have said there is, mm. and the people who have said that's no nonsense, mm. people who have said we have found that it is, and so on and so on. Mm. If you wipe all that out and say, look, I must find out, not as an individual, mm. they, can I find, can, can this truth of this bliss, this illumination, can come without depending on all that? See, if I am anchored, for example, in Hinduism, mm. with all the, <coughs> not the superficiality of it, mm not all the rituals and all the superstitions. If I'm anchored in the, in the religious belief of a Hindu, of a real Brahmin, I'm always anchored, and I may go very far, but I'm, I'm anchored there. Mm. That's not freedom. Because I must, there must be freedom to discover this, or come upon this. Yes. So we are going a little bit too far. No, but I would then go back and say, well, you, you put forward the question of the man who rejects all these traditions. You said, let us suppose that I'm the man who's rejected all these traditions. I would then say, well, what, is the, what reason do you have for rejecting all these traditions in such a way? Well, that seems to be the part of the, the problem that we've arrived at. If we've said that man is conditioned, Mm. biologically and socially mm. by his family. The tradition is part of that. Mm. We've, we've said that that's the problem that we're up against now. Is it possible for him to change his nature, or do we have to deal with each of these problems particularly as they come up? Well, what I was saying is that at the inner core of all the great religions of the world is a vision of this possibility yes. of a transformation whether it's called salvation or liberation or, or yes. nirvana or what. Mm -hmm. There's this vision. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, there have always been people within those religions who've had this vision and lived this vision. Now, uh, they... Sorry, go oh, on. Sorry. Well, perhaps part of your radical rejection of all religion involves denying <laughs> that. But if so, I would say, why? Why, why, I, why should we be so radicals to deny... I question whether they really, it may, I may be sacrilegious, so I may mm. be uh, an infidel, non-believer. I wonder if I am anchored to a certain organized belief, whether I can ever find the other. If I am a Buddhist, for example, mm. I believe that the Buddha is my saviour. Suppose I believe that. And that has been told to me from childhood. My parents have been Buddhists and so on, so on, so on. Mm. And as long as I am, as I have found that security in that idea, mm. or in that belief, in that person, mm. there is no freedom. No, but it's possible that you can move beyond that framework, you see, ah, starting from within it, that you can move beyond it. That beyond means it. I wipe out everything. It means you wipe it out. But there's a difference between an approach where you wipe it out from the beginning. From the beginning I'm talking. And, there's a, and an approach where you start within it and go beyond it. You see that weak way, yes, I know. This well known argument. <laughs> Which is important, breaking down all the barriers at the beginning, not at the end.
I'm a Hindu. I, I see what Hinduism is, lot of you know all the rest of it. And why should I go through number of years to be ended? Why can't I finish it the first day? Because I think you'd have to reinvent and rediscover for yourself a great many things that you would be able to get through more quickly if you didn't. I, no, his question is, <coughs> I am a living human being in relationship with him or with her. Mm. In that relationship I'm in conflict. Mm. He says, don't go about religion and illumination and nirvana and all the rest of it. Transform this, live rightly here, then the door is open. Yes, but surely isn't that easier said than done? Uh -huh. Easier said than done. I, mean, I, know, I know it's easier said than done, therefore let's find out. Let's, let me find out with him or with you or with her how to live in this world without conflict. Hmm. Right, sir? That's what we're asking. Can I find out? Or is that impossible? We don't know. No, therefore we start, we don't know. Okay. So let's inquire into that. Because if my... Um, if my relationship with life is not right, right in course for the moment, mm -hmm. how can I find out something that's immensely beyond all this, mm -hmm. beyond time, beyond thought, beyond measure? I can't. Still, we have established right relationship between us, mm -hmm. which is order. How can I find that which is supreme order? So I must begin with you, not with that. I don't know if you're meeting me. No, I would have thought that you could easily argue the other way around. Ah, course, course. <laughs> Until you have that, you can't get this right, because the whole history of man shows that starting just from... And therefore you invent that. You invent something illogical, may not be true, hmm. Maybe just invention of thought, mm. and you imagine that to be order, and hope that order will filter into you. It sounds, seems so illogical, irrational, whereas this is so rational. But is it possible? That is it. Let's find out. But you've now completely reversed your argument to start with, you see. He started with the patient coming to the psychiatrist's op office who wants to get his relationships right, his, get the human relationships out of this state of disorder and conflict into something that's more I am not sure this way, forgive me, Doctor, if I'm blundering to where the angels fear to trade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I question whether I'm doing right. But they're doing just what you said now, starting with the relationship and but not I, going to no, these bigger I, I questions. Whether they, they are really concerned with bringing about a right relationship between human beings, fundamentally, not superficially, just to uh, adjust themselves for the day. Hmm. Not, I don't think that you're denying that larger questions are involved in that. You're just saying that there, we shouldn't have invent ideas about what a solution would be like. Yes. I so, come to you, sir, let's wait a minute. Okay. I come to you with my problem. Yeah. I cannot get on with somebody, or I'm terribly depressed, mm -hmm. or something dishonest in me. Mm -hmm. I pretend. Yeah. I come to you. You are concerned to stay, tell me, become more honest, mm -hmm. but not find out what is real honesty. And don't we get into the problem of creating the idea of real honesty at this point? No, it's not an idea. I'm dishonest. Yes. You inquire why I'm dishonest. Yes. Go, 
penetrate into it, disturb me, don't pacify me. Yeah. Don't help me to say, but be a little more honest and a little more this or that, mm -hmm. but shake me so that I find out what his real honesty is. Okay, that's. I may disturb my. I may break away from the. You follow from yes. my conditioning, from my wife, from my parents, anything. You don't disturb me. No, that's. That's just my point. I do disturb you. Partially. Well, what? You disturb me in order to conform to little adjustments. Well, let's look at that. Sorry. Yeah. I disturb you to. Conform to little adjustments. Yes. You don't say to me, look, you're dishonest, let's go into it. I do say that. No, but go into it so that he is totally honest. Well, how deeply do I need to go into it so that I have disturbed you totally? Yeah, so what, so you tell me, do it now, sir. Okay, you, you come in and I, I in our talks, we've, Notice that the thing that you are up to is that you um, are always trying to find some other person to make your life be whole. Yes, I depend on somebody. Yes, deeply. Deeply. And you don't even know that. I... So I disturb you. I tell you that yes. that's what's going on. I show you you're doing it with me. Yes. I show you you're doing it with your husband. Yes. Now, is that sufficiently deep? No. Why? What have you shown me? A verbal picture. No, not verbal. Not verbal. Wait, wait. Okay. A verbal picture. Yeah. An argument, a thing which tells me that I'm dishonest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or whatever you take. Mm -hmm. That leaves me where? Well, if it's verbal, it just gives you more knowledge about yourself. That's all. Knowledge about myself. Yeah. Will knowledge transform me? No. No. Be careful, sir. Careful. Then why do I come to you? Well, not so that I can give you knowledge. You come thinking that maybe somehow I have some answers because other people, because the society is set why up so Why don't that you tell me, Paul? Do it yourself. Don't depend on me. Go into it. Find out. Stir. Okay, I tell you that. I tell you, go into it yourself. Ah. And you say to me, I, can't do I don't know what you're talking about. That just it. Yeah. So how will you help me to go into myself and not depend on you? You understand my question? Yes. Please, I'm not... I'm not the stage. <laughs> The only actor. <laughs> so this is really a serious question. How will you help me to go into myself so deeply that I understand and go beyond? You follow what I mean? No, I don't follow what you mean. I understand how to help you go into it without depending on me. I don't want to depend on you. I don't want to depend on anybody. Okay. I can help you do that. We can discover together that you're depending on me. But I don't know how deeply this has to go. So you have to inquire into dependence. Okay. Why am I depending? Security. Yeah. Where is security? Is there such a thing as security? Well, I have, these, I have these experiences as I grew up that taught me what security is. Yes, which is what? A projected idea. Yes. A principle. Yeah. A belief, a faith, a dogma, mm -hmm. or an ideal, which are all projected by me mm -hmm. or by you, and I accept those. Mm -hmm. But they are unreal. Okay. So can I push those away from Yes. And then you're not depressed. Ah! I'm, I'm, I'm dependent 
and therefore I get angry, jealousy, uh, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. That dependence makes me attached, mm -hmm. and that attachment is more, in that attachment there's more fear, there's more anxiety, there's more, you follow? Yes. So, can you help me to be free or in, find out what is true security? Is there a deep, abiding security? Not in furniture, not in a house, not in my wife or in some idea. Fun deeply, is there such thing as complete security? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm keeping all this yeah. So you're suggesting that if I simply work on this with you and you come to understand that you're dependent, that that's not sufficient because no. you won't have discovered any abiding security? No. Because that's all I want. I've sought security in this house, hmm? yeah. and it doesn't. There's no security. I've sought security in my wife. There isn't any. Mm -hmm. I've been a, I changed to another woman, but there isn't any either. Mm -hmm. Then I find security in a church, in a God, in a belief, in a faith, in some other symbol. The so, you see what is happening? You're all externalizing, if I can use that word, giving me security in things in which there are no security, in nations, mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Could you help us to find out if there is complete security which is unshakable? Are you suggesting this is one of our most fundamental needs I and drives and so. activities? I think so. Hmm. So indeed it's a fundamental question as to whether this sense of abiding, unshakable security is yes, possible. Yes. Because if once you have that, there is, there is no problem anymore. Well, this isn't clear because oh. then is it the individual that has that? No. The individual can never have that security. Because he's in himself divisive. 